Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you all. This week's edition of Training Tuesday, July 27th edition. Uh, we're going to talk about POs in ready to send status. Uh, if you recall, we had that new BEP contract percentage field that was made a required field just a few weeks ago. Um, if you have any of those POs that are in ready to send status, you may see a um, uh, red validation error, and we'll just talk about how to fix that. It's really easy. Um, and then our main topic today is we, we get questions from time to time on uh, what is, quote, curable or correctable and, and what isn't. And so uh, I figured it would be a good time to, to walk through some of those uh, items that are curable, meaning a vendor submits uh, paperwork or they don't have the correct registrations, those sorts of things. What can be cured? What cannot be cured? Um, We'll, we'll 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 dive into that in just a second, um, and then fun fact of the day and quote of the day. So first up, if uh, this is a slide that's been up um, on a couple of trainings in the past, but just to kind of set the table and put it into context for you guys, uh, that BEP contract percentage is a custom column field that was added uh, back in May um, at the beginning of this fiscal year, just a few weeks ago. It became a required field, so it has an asterisk next to it. Um, this is separate from the BEP goal percentage field, again, which is brought over from the bid stage. I just left this up. Um, we, we talked about a little bit more. Um, you can go back and take a look at the, the May 18th uh, training if you have any specific questions. Uh, but I just brought this slide up just to make sure that we all know kind of what we're talking about. Um, this automatically appears at the PO when yes is selected to that question, is there a BEP, VBP participation goal? Um, however, so we're all kind of on the same page there. However, if you have a PO that's now in ready to send status, uh, maybe it was, uh, you had a contract that was approved for execution prior to that BEP contract percentage field becoming a required field. So of course, you know, you're having those, um, that's activity that's happening outside of the system. Uh, but then as soon as that field was made a required field, um, you would see a red validation error um, if, that not, if that field was not completed at the time the field was made a required field. Um, so very easy solution. Um, you could just simply create a bid by change order uh, to enter that BEP contract percentage. So you, um, Again, this is just a, a bid by change order. So it's just within the system. You go up into the tab, the change orders tab, create change order, um, fill out that field, um, apply the change order, and then that red validation error is, is taken care of. Um, let's see. Oh, this is great. Thank you very much, Martha. I really appreciate this. Um, a reminder that if they are an SRM, then they will need to get that contract re-released too, if they have sent it through the interface already. Um, so in this case, some of these are the in that ready to send status. So they haven't yet, but that that's great. I really appreciate that. So again, if you're an SRM, they'll need to get that contract re-released if you've already sent it through the interface. Uh, now there shouldn't be too many of these, but um, there was a small window there where um, this field was made uh, required, um, so there shouldn't be a whole lot of them. But if, if you do see that error, you can simply create that and apply that change order. Okay. Again, if you have any specific questions regarding that, you can always reach out to uh, your APO or SPO, and we can make sure we, we get that taken care of. Okay. All right. So uh, more of our main topic today is common items that can cannot be cured. So common reasons that vendors are deemed non-responsive. And um, of course, we're not talking about the uh, 80s band, The Cure, or we're also not talking about uh, cured meats. Um, my lame attempt at humor on a Tuesday morning. So, you know, questions like, can this be cured? Can this be corrected? Can the vendor submit this later? These are, we're, we're talking about the same sorts of things, uh, just different words for the same thing. So the example is a vendor submits a quote, um, but doesn't have the, uh, doesn't attach the required paperwork, the required forms, or doesn't have the required registrations. Can it be corrected? So let's kind of unpack this a little bit. And before we get started, uh, for our conversations today, this is specifically for IFBs and RFPs. Um, on small purchases, there's a lot more flexibility because in the procurement code, many of the, these things, it, it talks about bids and offers. And so I just want to take a quick note to, you know, we're set aside, we're, 
we're setting aside, pun intended, I guess, for our small business set aside program. Uh, we're setting aside the conversation regarding small purchases uh, because those don't apply for what we're talking about today. So we're talking about bids and offers um, and what can and cannot be cured. Um, so these are just going to be the very common things. Also, if you have any specific questions, there will be a lot of different situations that I'm not going to be able to get into today. You'll need to talk to your SPO regarding that. Um, but we're just going to hit get some of the, the heavy hitters and some of the low hanging fruit here that we can point directly to code or rule that specifically calls out that they cannot be cured. So first up is the Board of Elections registration. So the vendor must be registered at the time of bid opening. And so the, I also put in some links here. So the slides, uh, you can go directly to the link at the code. Um, also in rule here, I also just kind of copied and pasted regarding bids and proposals. In order to be considered for award, a vendor who meets the requirements for registration must be registered with the State Board of Elections as of the date the bid or offer is due. Um, and then also, and shall provide a copy of the registration certificate or be able to produce the registration certificate on that date. Um, so that is technically in the rule. We, we don't necessarily require the vendor to submit their certificate. However, if we can't find them in the system for some reason, that's why you also, they have to be able to produce that certificate that was emailed to them. That doesn't come up a lot, but um, I have seen that uh, occur. So again, have to be registered at the time of bid opening. If a vendor is not registered by the date the bid or offer is due, the SPO shall reject the bid or offer as non-responsive. So pretty clear cut, uh, but we do get that question quite a bit. So that cannot be cured. Um, also, what else cannot be cured? Uh, not submitting Forms A, Forms B, financial disclosures. Um, if a vendor, so they, they have to submit that as a part of their uh, quote in bid buy for IFBs and RFPs. Also, additionally, if a vendor submits Forms B, they must have an active IPG registration at the time of bid opening. If they don't, they would have needed to submit Forms A, and this cannot be cured. So that's, it's a, a, a vendor outreach thing that we, we advise vendors all the time. If, and if you are in a situation where you, um, you may get this question, um, a, a vendor submits to the IPG, um, but the bid is do the bid opening is tomorrow, but they just submitted for IPG. Now we tell vendors that, um, in order to be registered in IPG, it's not just submitting to IPG. They must have an active registration. It must have been approved. They must have that um, IPG vendor registration number and an expiration date. Because again, that's what they fill out on Forms B is that number and the expiration date as well. Um, so if they did not have an active registration, again, going back to our example, the bid opening is tomorrow and I'm a vendor and I just am now submitting today to IPG, um, I need to really go ahead and submit Forms A, uh, complete Forms A for this particular procurement. And I think we've talked about this before, but just in case we have um, any, any new folks on and to understand the difference between using Forms B, they must have an active registration, which means they must have gone through the vetting process with the IPG team and uh, have, have been approved to be registered in the system. If not, they need to go uh, submit Forms A. And also there is a you know, week to 10 day window there, um, depending on what the workload is um, and, the, and the queue, how many vendors have submitted. Uh, the IPG team has been knocking it out of the park lately and those numbers are very, very low. However, we know that isn't always the case. So it really depends um, throughout the year. Okay, uh, so that can't be cured. Next up, uh, not submitting a BEPU plan, um, if applicable. So on those procurements that uh, do have a BEP goal, if a vendor does not submit a BP utilization plan, uh, that cannot be cured. If you have specific, um, if you have specific questions regarding um, what constitutes a completed BE utilization plan, um, those questions really need need to be referred to BEP. Um, and I, I wouldn't be able to answer those today, so I kind of want to cut that off at the pass. Um, if you have questions regarding what uh, you, a completed U plan is, you need to go ahead and um, uh, reach out to BEP. Uh, we have a question here. 
what if the vendor submits forms B and provides the wrong registration number? All right, so we're going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, spoiler alert, that's okay. That can be corrected. Um, next up, so this isn't really applicable right now. It's just moving forward as we um, hopefully enter a, um, a, a world where the, the pandemic isn't dictating so much of our lives not attending a mandatory pre-bid conference. I put this on here just because as we move forward and if things eventually go back to normal, you will have um, the possibility for mandatory pre-bid conferences. Now, of course, if a vendor didn't attend a mandatory pre-bid conference, there's no way to really cure that. Um, so that's why I put it on the list here. Now, just as a reminder, we're currently not allowing uh, mandatory pre-bid conferences, of course, you can do optional, um, and agencies have, have gotten very creative with um, being able to put out information to vendors using videos, you know, where in the past you would do uh, site walkthroughs, those sorts of things. Um, agencies have been great about, <clears throat> excuse me, agency of, agencies have been great about being creative, putting videos on their solicitations, those sorts of things, in order to not have to get together in person. Um, and of course, we're not doing mandatory pre-bid conferences at this time um, in person, I should say. We're not doing mandatory in-person pre-bid conferences. So, but moving forward, if we, if and when we get back to that world, um, if a vendor didn't attend, of course, that cannot be cured. Um, and then also, this is also a, um, uh, regarding our small business set-aside program, not being registered in small business set aside program at the time of bid opening for a small business set aside procurement. So um, those are publicly posted. If a vendor submits, um, and this is one of those 600 codes that are set aside for small businesses. Again, this is an IFB or an RFP. If it is one of those codes, but the vendor is not, uh, was not registered in the small business set aside program at the time of bid opening, of course that cannot be cured either. Okay, so now let's talk about what can be cured. Um, and so I, in this, on this slide, I put cured in quotes because it's not necessarily a curability, but you'll, you'll kind of get what I mean here. Um, the Secretary of State Registration um, authorized to transact business in Illinois. Here's the link to the um, section 2043 of the code. Bidder or offer authorized to transact business um, may qualify as a bidder offer under the code only if the person is a legal entity prior to submitting the bid, offer, or proposal. The legal entity must be authorized to transact business or conduct affairs in Illinois prior to the execution of the contract. So up to this point, we've been talking about um, things that the, the, the vendor has to be uh, registered for at the time of bid. Now we're moving to, this is the execution of the contract for SOS. Um, this was a change from a couple years ago. This used to be at time of bid as well, um, but that was that was changed and now it is. The entity must be registered with the Illinois Secretary of State at the time of the execution of the contract. However, let's go back and take a look at this. They still must be a legal entity. Sorry, let me go back. Must be a legal entity prior to submitting the bid. So, um, let's say a, a St. Louis business, must have been registered in Missouri, at least, prior to the bid or offer or proposal. However, they must be registered with the Illinois Secretary of State at the time of execution of the contract. And so going back to you know what I put the cured in quotes is when you guys are doing your uh, administrative review, you're going through all the paperwork for your um, low-cost uh, bidder or offerer, and you come across this, it's not necessarily something that needs to be cured, quote, because it's not really technically required until the execution of the contract. Um, but if a vendor is not registered with the Illinois Secretary of State, you want to go ahead and get that taken care of because you wouldn't want to get all the way to the point where you have a, um, it's sitting at the SPO for approval of the execution of the contract. And then only then it comes out that uh, the vendor is not registered with the Illinois Secretary of State. So really, it's just one of those things that, um, you know, want to check it early on. So just in case, they um, uh, an another situation that could come up is they're not in good standing. 
right? So they're registered with the Secretary of State. They just are not in good standing. So we want to make sure that that um, we're not holding anything up at the execution of the contract later on. Um, but the SPO cannot approve at that time. So again, um, we just want to be heading that off at the pass. So go ahead and uh, and and check that when you're. Um, going through your admin review, and that way, maybe the vendor can get that taken care of on their end as you're uh, moving through the process. Okay. Um, also, what so what can be cured? So going back to our uh, question, what if the vendor submits forms B and provides the wrong registration number? Um, corrections on these documents is okay. So a correction needed on a financial disclosure, conflicts of interest, uh, clarification, or in this case. They put the wrong number on forms B, but you can easily, you know, we can search by the name and see that, yes, they were registered um, at the time of bid opening. Now, um, just to kind of do a quick little deep dive on this question, if they put the, pre, the, the quote wrong IPG registration number and it was from an expired registration, but they had not renewed, now they wouldn't need to be deemed non responsive. So there are a lot of, um, almost like a, maybe a bad joke, but like a choose your own adventure here, if this, then this, um, situations that you can get into. But if, in this case, if um, it was just a clarification or a clerical type error, uh, the wrong number was put on Forms B, but you can easily go back and um, see that they are registered, they've been registered um, in IPG, that's totally okay. Uh, we would want it corrected because you wanna have the corrected Forms forms B, but, um, those corrections on financial disclosures, conflicts of interest documents are okay. But just as a reminder, the vendor must have submitted those documents at the time of bid opening. Because um, uh, as, as we spoke to earlier, at the time of bid opening, they must have uh, provided that documentation. But you can go back and, and make those corrections. We see that quite a bit, as a matter of fact, um, you know, maybe uh, they didn't disclose a parent entity or something like that. You can you know, get a lot of those sort of situations. Um, also, again, uh, what can be cured? Illinois Department of Human Rights registration is needed by contract award. Okay, so um, again, I put it cured in parentheses just because at this point we've been talking about what's due at the time of bid opening. Um, and in the Human Rights Act, I put a uh, quick little link there for the Dep Department of Human Rights registration is required in order to be awarded a contract. So it's a little different than being at uh, bid opening. And then we're also gonna have many other specific scenarios arise. Like I said, we can't get into all those on a call like this. Um, but if you do have any of those questions, please discuss with your SPO first before contacting a vendor. Um, that's important. Uh, let's see. Just to be clear, if a vendor does not submit the signed contract or offer, then that is curable. Um, you have to reach out to your SPO regarding that specific. So I, I you know, I'm not sure if that j documents a a correction um, or not, depending on the contract or offer, uh, as those are two different uh, documents there. Um, but I can follow up with that for sure, and I'll I can. Um, add that as a follow-up for next week maybe as well. And so kind of a reminder here for, or a, a quick tip, I guess, in terms of these required registrations, it's easy as one, two, three, like the Jackson 5 song. So one at time of bid opening is Illinois Board of Elections. At time of contract award, Illinois Department of Human Rights. And at time of contract execution is the Secretary of State. Now, in a perfect world, and, and, and quite honestly, in many of these vendors' worlds, they're already registered for all three, and and they're you know they're good to go, and they're okay at the time of bid opening. Um, but we do want to, you know, do a, a little bit of a deep dive and remind that a couple of these registrations are not technically at bid opening; they're ones at contact contract award, ones at contract execution. However, again, with that Illinois Secretary of State, it's Illinois Secretary of State at the contract execution, at the time of execution. However, they must have been a legal entity in their uh, home state in order to, uh, to even submit a, a bid or offer. Okay.
All right. Um, okay, so quickly, what happens when a vendor is deemed non-responsive? I know we've talked about this in the past, but just uh, it seems like an obvious next step for us. Um, you're going to complete the request for and determination of non-responsive or not responsible form. And I have the link directly to that. Um, it, it's found in our procurement resource library. And so quickly, why don't I show you real quick where this is. So in the CPOGS website, procurement resource library, and then you scroll down. It's in the uh, state purchasing officer determination forms. So there's that request for and determination of non-responsive and not responsible form. It looks like this. You Where all the green boxes are, you'll go in and just complete the information. Um, you will also have the the vendor's name, the disqualification, are the you, are you, is the agency requesting non-responsiveness or not responsible, the factual basis for disqualification. Um, it can be as some, something as simple as at this point, um, Dave's Corporation or you know vendor Dave's Corporation uh, was not registered with Board of Elections at the time of bid opening. The statute rule solicitation requirement basis for disqualification can simply be you can um, is, is the citation that's actually in the in the slide. So you could go back and take a look at the slide real quick. For um, in our case, we're doing the Board of Elections registration. Boom. 30 ILCS 500-2160. You can cite that there on the section right there. Then get the appropriate agency approvals um, and signature on this document, and then it's sent to the SPO. Let's go back to our slides here. You obtain the appropriate agency signature, send to the SPO for approval or denial of the request and, and their signature. And also, this is important. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Communicate to the vendor the reason uh, for being deemed non-responsive. Um, you know, we want to have vendors know why they um, are deemed non-responsive, so that they can fix it for next time. We, of course, we want as many vendors to be responsive as possible. Uh, we want as much competition as possible, and we want to be able to communicate that information to the vendor so they know. Um, and then. Just a reminder, as always, make sure to attach uh, that non-responsive form into bid buy. Okay, uh, where can you find the training Tuesday in the bid buy training links? That's the slide that we keep each week, just so you can go ahead and, and get into this. Um, and then our fun fact of the day. So one of President John Tyler's grandson is still alive today, and he was born in 1790. How is this possible? So President Tyler, the 10th U.S. president, was 63 when his son, Lion Tyler, was born in 1853. Lion's son was born when he was 75. And President Tyler's living grandson, Harrison Tyler, is currently 92. Kind of crazy. Lion's other son, Lion Jr., passed away at the age of 95. The Tyler family still maintains the president's home, Sherwood Forest in Virginia. Um, and then I kind of uh, flaked on the quote of the day, so I apologize. Had to you know, write one in at 8.55. Uh, I can't believe John Tyler's grandson is still alive. That's kind of crazy. That's my quote of the day. Um, any other questions, you can always reach out to cpogs.training. Um, again, any of those specific curable items, um, reach out to your SPO. That's where a lot of the other scenarios will come into play. Um, and I, sorry, got a late question coming in. Is a BEP review deemed non-responsive curable? Um, I think, I mean, I'm not quite sure I understand the question for sure. If they're, if they're deemed non-responsive due to BEP issues, um, the, you know, is it curable? I guess it, if, if it's, if the SPO is deeming them non-responsive due to BEP issues, they're non-responsive. Um, do they get a one-time cure? You know, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to refer you to BEP regarding any sort of uh, curability. Um, the, the the one question that I, I know we, if a vendor does not submit a U plan at all, then they're deemed non-responsive. Um, but I'm going to have to refer you to, to BEP there. 
All right, everybody, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, the recording will be posted as long as well as the slides in the training center. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you.